This is the Monday, June 19th, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week... Our time machine joins up with legendary explorers Lewis and Clark and traces the clash of cultures between Europeans and the Native American Nez Perce tribe through William Clark's real-life son, Daytime Smoke, whose mother was a Nez Perce woman. Playing our guide on this journey is David Osborne, who shares his ambitious debut novel, The Coming. David has five nonfiction books to his credit, and you've seen his work in The Atlantic, New York Times Magazine, Harper's, and many other places fine opinion writing is found. He's also a senior fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute, directing the Reinventing America's Schools Project. You can visit our guest on Twitter at Osborne David. Okay, now that we've provisioned ourselves for the trip, let's hitch up with David Osborne and Witness... The Coming. I'm joined on the line by David Osborne, who's here to chat about his debut novel, The Coming. Thank you for making time to chat with the History Author Show. Oh, it's my pleasure, Dean. Thank you for your interest. I really was amazed and impressed by this book. I'll probably have to refrain from superlatives about it. You work in the policy and political arena, so... This story must have had something that really compelled you to invest time in it, because I'm looking at the calendar and I'm thinking, okay, election year, so that's when there'd be a lot of wonkish stuff to write about and for you to do and demands on your attention. I'm sure you wanted to maybe sit and watch the debates or something like that. So what was it about this story that compelled you to write it at this time? Well, that's a really good question. To be honest, I didn't write it at this time. I started this book in 2001 and worked on it part time, you know, in my spare time over a decade. There were a few years I had to do other things, couldn't work on it, turned it into the publisher in 2014 and the publisher was quite slow to publish it. So (laughs) it took a long time. But why was I so compelled to write it? Because I was, it was, you're absolutely right. It was, uh, I was just called to do this. And that's a mystery in many ways. I can tell you that when I was 19 years old, I went on a trip on what's called the Nez Perce Trail, which is the battle sites from the 1877 war. And I read a book about the Nez Perce and I read some of the Lewis and Clark journals. So I was familiar with those two stories and I had very vivid memories of Nez Perce country, which is quite beautiful. And then 25 years later, I had finished my third book and was completely burned out. Just, you know, I'd been working way too hard for a dozen years on these three books. I had four young children. Uh, my wife was a obstetrician, busy. Life was too full. I was completely burned out after this third book and felt, just felt like doing something completely different and was watching Ken Burns' documentary called The West. And I learned in one episode that William Clark had left behind a pregnant Nez Perce woman and had therefore had a Nez Perce son, whether he ever knew it or not, probably didn't. And in the next episode, learned that that son was alive and part of the war in 1877. And I just kind of mentally sat up bolt upright and thought, my God, those are the bookends to an amazing story, because I knew something about the Nez Perce story. And, you know, Lewis and Clark and the Chief Joseph's War, those are two of the most iconic tales of the West. 
So it just grabbed me and I began to explore it. I went out to Oregon to a writer's conference where there were a, a fair number of Nez Perce attending and I decided it was completely impractical <laughs> because I lived in Massachusetts and Nez Perce culture was different than my culture. And so I would need to spend time out there and how in the world was I going to be able to do that? And it just wouldn't leave me alone. I mean, I spent literally five years trying to keep it on the back burner. And then finally, sadly, about Christmas time in 2000, a few days after the Supreme Court elected George Bush president over the guy I had worked for, Al Gore. So I was like just sick and done with politics at that point. My wife came home and said she had cancer and she was going to die. It was terminal. It was stage four. Gosh. And, you know, I was in shock for about a month, but being confronted with mortality makes you really stop and think that if there's anything you've always wanted to do, you'd better get about it because you don't know how long you have. And I had always, since I was, you know, 17 or 18 year olds, wanted to write a novel. And in my late twenties, I tried and failed. <laughs> I just decided, you know what? I probably can't do this. It's probably too hard. But I'm just going to try. And I spent, you know, what spare time I had and started working on it and started going out for a week or 10 days at a time when I could to Idaho and cross the Lolo Trail over the Bitter Roots and got to know some Nez Perce and just kept working on it oh. for a long time. It's incredible that that's what brought you to it, yet you looked for something positive and or something positive to put your thoughts into and, and evaluate yourself. Because to me... I mentioned to you before we started that a first-time novelist should be inspired by your story. And I think that now you having told me your personal story behind it, that's a story for anybody. And that's something that certainly here, when you talk about the Nez Perce and this clash of cultures and they're being wiped out, their way of life is clearly ebbing away. It's never going to be the same. They're being having treaties broken out from under them and things. And yet, they have to persevere. But the fact that they survive to this day is a testament to that. They certainly don't have the life that they used to have, but our life is quite different from 100 years ago as well, yeah. or 200 or 800, yeah. depending where we come from in the world, right? So Absolutely. that's really a story here that maybe you could identify with. Well, I, I was inspired by them. I, I have, for some reason, and that's why I say it's really a mystery why I was so called to do this. Since I was a kid, I've really identified with Native Americans. You know, when I was in third and fourth grade, I checked every book about Native Americans out of the library. I remember there was one series, one book about each tribe, and they were actually quite boring, but I read them. <laughs> I, was just, I was just fascinated by Native Americans. And uh, in college, I went to Stanford. There was one Native American undergraduate my freshman year, and he was in my dorm on my floor. He was a full-blood Oglala Sioux from Montana, from the Fort Peck Reservation. And he and I became very close friends. Anyway, so I've had this connection, and you know who knows what that comes from. The Nez Perce would say that they believe in reincarnation. They believe that we've had multiple past lives. And so they would tell you that I was a Nez Perce, and I went through this. <laughs> that's why I was so compelled to write about it. But, you know, maybe that's true. I don't know. I remember Stephen King said once when they asked him where he gets his ideas, he said, well, people ask as if there's an idea store that you go to and you say, OK, I'd like to write one novel, please. And oh, by the way, I have only written nonfiction in your case, but I would like a really good idea. That's why reading is so important. And I mean, reading actual books. I was carrying your book on the train and on the subway and everything with me and I don't like really the ebooks, and one reason why is it's so easy to swipe to something else and go to another app or check your email, but you put that book in the hands of somebody, and you never know what it's going to stimulate. There's so many things in your book here that are coming to be inspired by and to learn not to be afraid to dive into other cultures. I think one of the backlashes maybe from today where we don't want to offend people but we might be afraid to go and meet somebody who happens to be, you know, hey, you're all right, you're the only Native American here. You might think, well, I don't want to talk to him. I might say the wrong thing. You know, we have mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. slang words, right, that could easily be used. You don't mean anything by it, but you might shy away, and yet you didn't. And then I see you freed up here to write the coming because you read about here Swan Lightning. She remarks on the introduction of a written language by Europeans. That's something that I thought – 
here's a challenge for you. I wanted to ask you, if there's nothing written down, you can't do that historical part of historical fiction. And this is how you're doing yeah. your research, right? Well, you know, I was lucky because a lot has been written about the Nez Perce. They are in the Northwest. It's a very well-known tribe and a well-known history. And of course, they had oral tradition. All the native tribes did. And they would have each village would have a typically a historian who would memorize all the stories and tell them to the children. And so they did pass down a history. And there were people who wrote that stuff down later. A couple of things happened. There was a woman named Zoe Swain, who is no longer with us, but, oh, I'm not sure when this was, 30 years ago, maybe. She wrote a book and published a book of the Nez Perce stories about Lewis and Clark combined with the stories from the journals. So you get both sides. And then there was one of the young warriors from the war who ended up going back to the reservation in Washington state with Joseph and about 150 others. His name was Yellow Wolf. And he befriended a rancher in the area. And the rancher, whose name was McWhorter, ended up publishing two books, one about the war, and he traveled around to all the battle sites with Yellow Wolf and some of his friends, and they showed him where this happened. They told them all the stories. And then another book just about the Nez Perce in general and their history. So those sources were very important. And then there, there's a wonderful historian who's also no longer with us, Alvin Josephi Jr., wrote probably a dozen books about Native Americans, but his classic is a 600-page history of the Nez Perce, just a fantastic book. So I was lucky. There was a lot of material, but there was a lot I couldn't access, too, like about their spiritual life. So I had to find other routes to figure that stuff out. You have something about that, a quote in part two of The Coming. You actually start off part two with it. It's by Captain Benjamin Bonneville, and he describes the Nez Perce as an honest, pure, pious in their religion. He says it's almost not enough to call them religious because they're so enthusiastic. They so abide by the rules. They're certainly not some of the people we say stereotypical go to church twice a year, say, in the Christian tradition. This is 1832 he's writing this. You feature missionaries evangelizing to Native people throughout the coming. I believe that Daytime Smoke, for example, confesses and accepts Christ in your book, so yeah. that's something that actually happened. I wonder how did joining a church help adjust to this changing world if you were a member of a Native tribe? Well, first let me say that the, the missionaries left voluminous written history as well. They wrote letters you know, they were out in the wilderness alone. And so they wrote journals, they wrote letters, they wrote reports to their mission board. And there was a fellow named Drury who published their journals. You know, this is 30 years ago, maybe. Did a lot of work, published their letters, their journals. So all of that is accessible. The Nez Perce, let me give you a little of the background of why they wanted missionaries, because it's fascinating. In their worldview, and this is very typical of Native peoples, power came from spiritual sources. They all went on a vision quest when they were 10 or 11 or 12 years old, out into the wilderness for days at a time with no food, until they had a vision and were visited by a force of nature. Typically it was an animal, but sometimes it was something like the wind or the fog or lightning. This became their spirit guide, if you will, that would help them through life, that would protect them. And so, you know, power came from sources like that. So they looked at these white people who had guns and ammunition and later on wagons with wheels and they could make things out of iron and steel. And, you know, they had knives. They had all these things that the native people didn't have. And so obviously they had a lot of power. So the Nez Perce would ask, you know, where does this power come from? And, and eventually they'd hear about God and Jesus and the Bible. And they concluded that that was the source of power for these white people, and they wanted it. So they were really desperate at a certain point to get to learn about it. And Nez Perce sent four men to St. Louis, which is like a three-month journey, a couple thousand miles, in 1831 to ask William Clark, 
who was still there. All the tribes knew of him because he was in charge of of the Louisiana Territory. They sort of knew him as the red-haired chief to ask him for Bibles and missionaries. And, you know, they thought that literally the Bible had power in it. They didn't understand about written words and stories. They thought it was an object that had power. But um, anyway, that led to missionaries arriving. Over time, about half the tribe converted, but it led to a big split in the tribe because there were those who refused to convert and those who converted. So it was a big part of their history. Lewis and Clark, their interactions with the tribesmen when they're using medicines that they have, in your book, they're very clear that, hey, no, this isn't that kind of power. This isn't a spiritual thing. It comes from medicine. I can't, I'm not curing everything. It's not in me. Also, this is explaining to the medicine man there who's saying, well, if I can't do it, you can't do it. And you know, this happens even among fellow doctors, right? To new ways of, for instance, germ therapy are rejected by new people. But Lewis and Clark, they seem to varying degrees to confront that not as you would think a stereotypical way would be that, okay, hey, these are silly children. Oftentimes we picture these explorers talking to the native people like they're just children and don't know anything. They're upfront about who they are. And I saw them in a way that wasn't just them on the back of a coin or like Simon and Garfunkel. You think of any duo and you forget that there's a line where one man begins and the other man ends and vice versa. They really seem to be able to strike that balance. And the fact that he has a son here in daytime smoke who also has red hair. That's that's a legacy too. And he continually trades on that on both sides and will say that I am the son. And so people know his name. It doesn't always work, doesn't always help him. Sometimes people are really rude to him throughout the course of the book because they don't like if you're a person of mixed race. But they really had a handle for it. And you were able to tap into all of that, I guess, from their diaries. From Lewis and Clark's diaries, yeah, that and the oral tradition from the Nez Perce, which, as I said, a few people had written down. And also, I was really interested in this interaction, collision, whatever you want to call it, between the Nez Perce worldview and the white American worldview. And one of the places it happened or was around healing because they had such different approaches. For the Nez Perce, you, you had basically medicine men who called on the world of spirit to heal people. And Lewis and Clark had their medicines. <laughs> and, you know, they, were, they weren't terribly refined. I mean, they were using uh, mercury, for example, to treat people. A lot of the people who were part of that, the core of discovery with Lewis and Clark died early. <laughs> and the, huh. one of the theories is that they got sexually transmitted diseases on the West Coast from the tribes that had interacted a lot with uh, Europeans who came by boat. And then they were treated by Lewis and Clark with mercury, uh. <laughs> which, of course, is deadly. Yeah. Anyway, this sort of miscomprehension between the two cultures was just so fascinating to me. And I kept trying to to play with that in the book and to give you a, you know, a scene from a native point of view and then a scene from a white point of view and have them sort of passing in perception like two ships in the night without really connecting. But early on, a lot of it was about healing. They decided Clark was a very powerful healer because he had a few things that had worked for people like liniment for a sore muscle. So he did a lot of healing in exchange for food. Um, and, you know, you mentioned Lewis and Clark. They were, they were very different people. Lewis was much more the kind of person who would speak to Indians as if they were children. In fact, we have the text of a speech he gave, and I used it in the book, and he called them children. Clark was more of a people person, and he was the one who usually dealt with the Indians and got on with them. And I think he had more of an appreciation for their way of life. That's the impression I got from the journals. Well, it comes across certainly in the coming. I enjoyed that very much because the obvious concern that you would have as a writer and somebody would have picking up the book with Native Americans featured in it is you don't want to be condescending and stereotypical. You don't want it to come across like F Troop where it's farcical and granted the Indians here, they don't have the article the, but you don't want to have them speaking in a way that seems right. like, well, that's a, an offensive caricature it would suck you right out of it. 
authors and people in general can go too far in the other direction. And then you drift into the noble savage caricature, which is right. no less offensive or unpleasant to read where, for instance, oh, his medicines will fail. And then you'll have the magic medicine man come in and it's just as offensive. These are people and you manage to describe them in the coming as just that human beings who come from completely different world and they're trying to grope their way through and get to know each other. I wonder how in these, now you've said about 15 years here to write it, how did you guard against swaying too far one into the other? Or because you had this wide experience with the culture, were you never really concerned about that? Did you just no, I was, do it off the top of your head? I was very concerned about that. And, you know, I was told repeatedly that a lot of Nez Perce wouldn't like the white person writing about this. Problem is, I was writing about a collision between two civilizations. And, you know, if if a white person can't write about the Nez Perce, does that mean the Nez Perce can't write about whites? Does that mean this story can never be told? Yeah. I just, I couldn't accept that. But, I, you know, I appreciate what you're saying about the characters. And to be honest, a lot of it's trial and error. I mean, I made a lot of those errors along the way. I have wrote scenes that were too noble savages, that were too naive, that painted too idealistic a picture. But fortunately, I had a couple of mentors who would read drafts for me and <laughs> point out my errors, and I'd throw that out. I probably did 15 drafts of this book, and you just keep honing it and getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work and keeping the stuff that does work. And then at a certain point, you know those characters so well that you stop making those mistakes. And you know, the truth is, there were all kinds of different Nez Perce. There were people who were really egotistical. There were people with some bad intent. There were people who were wonderful. You know, they're human beings like all other human beings. We're speaking with David Osborne about his debut novel. It's called The Coming. You can follow him on Twitter at Osborne David. The Salem News writes of the book, quote, Osborne, who has written nonfiction books, steps into the realm of historical fiction in The Coming in which he weaves a tale of friendship, betrayal, and ultimately war during the time of America's Western expansion, unquote. David, the word that jumps out at me from that review is betrayal. There are just so many over the course of the coming. You have points where an American governor and soldiers are talking about having another treaty. And the way that they talk about it, it's jumping off the page at me. And it's literally as if it's just a piece of paper. Theodore Roosevelt once described it, for instance, people talking about reform that way. He'd say they talk about it like it's a concrete substance, like cake. And having worked in a campaign and around policy, I'm sure you can think of your own your own uses of the word reform. He says, yo, let's have reform. Let's go just hand out pieces to everybody. It's supposed to be you giving your word. And yet talk about no concept of a written language. They'll write these treaties and the people who supposedly are writing them will just not respect them and blow them off and violate them on a whim. I wonder how you kept those broken words from turning the coming into just a story of those tragic repetitions. Ah, oh, that's a very good question. And my wife and my mentor friend who read a bunch of drafts would tell you that I, I made that mistake <laughs> for a long time. I, they kept telling me, enough of the treaty councils. <laughs> <laughs> because I was so taken with the history, and it is a history of betrayal. The thing that's so fascinating about the Nez Perce story is that they loved Americans because of Lewis and Clark, because they bonded with them, because they actually intermarried, right, with Clark. They loved Americans, and when the fur trappers started arriving, they embraced them, and they helped them, and they lived with them, and they married them. And then they went and asked for missionaries. And when they came, they embraced them. And when settlers started to arrive and wars started to erupt because of whites taking native land, taking native horses and cattle, killing natives, and then also mining gold on native land, the Nez Perce would be torn. And they ended up at first helping the U.S. against their friends. So this tribe was the best friend that we had in that part of the country, unbelievably loyal to Americans. And they were first rewarded for it. When the first treaties were written, they got to keep 90% of their land, unlike many of their neighboring tribes. 
which were dispossessed. But five years later, in 1860, gold was discovered on their land. And, you know, within a few years, there were 20,000 miners and only 5,000 Nez Perce. And the government then negotiated another treaty, which is known as the Thief Treaty, which half of the tribe refused to sign. But the government pretended as if the entire tribe had signed and imposed it on them, which led finally to war. Uh, So it really was an act of betrayal of people who had been so helpful and so loyal to Americans. It's a real tragedy. That's another one of the quotes you have at the beginning of a chapter where they're describing to you saying, I believe it's if I wanted to purchase a horse from you, you say, no, I won't sell it to you. And then I go to your neighbor and say, hey, will you sell me your, you know, his horse? And he says, sure. And then you come back and say, oh, I own that horse now. Yeah, let me read it to you. Okay, great. This is actually from Chief Joseph. He gave a speech in Washington, D.C. when he was pleading. He went to Washington repeatedly and met with secretaries of defense and I think they called them secretaries of war at the time, with congressmen, with presidents, pleading for the right to go back to their land when they were sent to Oklahoma after the war. He said this in a speech. Suppose a white man should come to me and say, Joseph, I like your horses. I want to buy them. I say to him, no, my horses suit me. I will not sell them. Then he goes to my neighbor who says, pay me money and I will sell you Joseph's horses. The white man returns to me and says, Joseph, I have bought your horses and you must let me have them. If we sold our lands to the government, this is the way they bought them. And it's exactly right. (laughs) Yeah. They're all human beings. As you said there, I was going to interject that when you described that some of the Nez Perce think ill of the Sopoyos or the Soyapos. I don't know how they were to pronounce it. Soyapos, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty good. (laughs) The uh, slang for whites that they use. And you're describing they, there were some of them that were arrogant. There were some of them that were easily duped. Some of them that chide others and say, hey, we don't understand the ways of these foreigners, these new migrants coming through. They'd seen other tribes before. And so any more than we know theirs. And as you were talking, I was going to say almost like they're human beings. Hey, who would have thought that people are the same everywhere, as we used to say? She sees, who is it? Is it Clark when he's bathing in the ocean or in the water out of the lake? And she says, oh, gosh, he showed himself to me naked. And she's saying, why Why don't they bathe more? That kind of thing. And this is just a different world. At the time, Europeans are thinking that bathing makes you sick. So they weren't bathing like the way that the native people were. So the class of cultures, but then you say, who does it break for? And here it's breaking in the example there that Chief Joseph gave, breaking against them. But also you're saying these Native people don't know anything. They don't have a concept of a written language. And yet you turn around and you're going to hold them to somebody signing a contract and define that signature and what the contract means for everybody based on what suits you. You know, the story of Western expansion is it's the story of taking things from people, taking their homelands. And treaties were constantly violated. It's a part of our history that we we like to forget. You quote William Clark at one point as supporting one of these relocations. Specifically, he wants to see the tribes relocated across the Mississippi. This would be west of the Mississippi, so yep. out of the way, so to speak. So they're, the, they'll be a little protected and the white people will have their own land. But he laments that President Andrew Jackson, as you describe it, quote, hated Indians too much to let them leave with dignity, let them leave their ancestral lands in this case. Were those Clark's actual feelings on what would become something like the Trail of Tears? That's a very good question. I believe they were, but he was a very important man. He was governor of the Louisiana Territory, uh, and then he was superintendent of Indian Affairs in the Louisiana Territory. Those two offices, that went on for 25 years. And he did, there was a huge question, what should we do with these tribes? They're in the way. And he did support moving them west of the Mississippi, all of the tribes. Did he come to regret it is the question, or did I put that in his mind? I think looking back, you know, he wrote letters to, uh, there's a volume of published letters. There's a couple of biographies. I would have to go back and look at them to be sure, but I believe that he did have some regrets. I describe people coming through St. Louis and being sent to the Oklahoma Territory, which was known as Indian Territory then, was solely for the natives, basically starving, dying. That's what was going on, and he was aware of it. You know, I don't see how it could not have affected him. 
he had enough respect for native peoples. So I'm sorry, I'd have to go back to those sources and check for sure. It's been a few years. Well, it is historical fiction, so it encourages yes, people it to go and <laughs> maybe they won't read that 600 page book or one like that, but they may be inspired to. And I think this little bit there where you include that of William Clark thinking that, or he's talking to somebody actually at the time about Jackson and disagreeing with Jackson, even though he says, I voted for the SOB, in his words, it indicates that there were different views and your book illustrates that. And so I think whether that's a direct quote in the historical record, it does show this idea that runs throughout the coming, this thread of people are disagreeing, there's factions, not all of the people who are coming that are European are the same. You're fortunate in that Lewis and Clark disagree so much and have such different views there. But this shows it. The president's not somebody who everybody's unified behind his efforts here to drive the Cherokee, in the case of the Trail of Tears, off of their land. And the Native people, you've talked about already two splits that I recall here in our chat today, one between whether to convert and the one whether to sell the lands. There's many, many splits here. Everybody's a person. And I think that makes her a great book. Yeah, that's true. And uh, Jackson really was infamous for the way he treated Native Americans. He just hated them, looked at them as subhuman. And many people at the time were horrified by what he did to the Cherokee and the Creeks and the others he dispossessed. The Trail of Tears is one of those other iconic, tragic stories, very similar to what happened to the Nez Perce, and very, very sad. I wanted to touch on one more thing, which is about the Nez Perce using signing to communicate. Mm-hmm. This makes the coming unique, and I keep going back to the fact that it's a debut novel. This is impressive because I can hear some editors and some writers throwing up their hands and saying, well, you can't possibly do that. Let's put words in their mouths and forget the fact they didn't use the article. The Just write the dialogue so everybody can follow it. But I'm here to tell everybody listening that I was able to follow it no problem. There's one particular particular conversation that a character called Black Eagle has, and he signs his thoughts with passion and at such length that it's a credit to you as a writer because you write it very clearly. I never missed the quotation marks. Mm -hmm. Angela's Ashes won the Pulitzer Prize, and he never used quotation marks or capitalized. So I thought of that a little bit here. But I wonder, how did you meet that challenge in writing dialogue so that as a reader, somebody could enjoy that part of the book and not be caught up and say, well, what's happening here? Yeah, it was a challenge. It was a challenge because, as you know, having read it, it's very close to history. I love historical fiction that is really close to what actually happened. And it gives me a sense of, wow, this must be how it felt, what it was like. And that's what I was trying to do. So the truth was, there was a lot of signing that went on. People don't realize that in the West, most of the tribes signed with each other. That's how they communicated. And you can communicate almost anything in sign language. And it was quite well developed. And I had Nez Perce people tell me people would talk and sign at the same time often. It was pretty central. Everybody knew it. They, in essence, spoke two languages, at least two languages. Sometimes they'd speak another one of a neighboring tribe. So I wanted to capture that and yet not lose the reader. And so I did some research on sign language and came to the conclusion that you really can communicate almost anything that way, and that they really were fluent in it. And so I just decided, well, I'm going to treat it like spoken language. I'm just not going to put quotation marks around it, and that will distinguish that they're signing. And I use the word, you know, he signed rather than he said to tip the reader off. What you do is you, you do your best, you write it, and then you go back through it and you say, well, that's not quite clear. And you figure out a way to make that clear that he's signing and or he's speaking or she's signing. You just polish it until you've got the ambiguities out and it's clear to the reader. You know, people think that writers <laughs> write these first drafts that <laughs> are just luminous and wonderful. Well, it's not the case for most of us. <laughs> I always love... Calvin Trillin, who was the famous writer for The New Yorker for years and later The Nation, he wrote an article, I think, about writing at one point, and he described his first drafts as his vomit outs. (laughs) (laughs) And I always thought that was great because I would never show a first draft to anyone. I mean, (laughs) they're always bad. Uh, I would never show anything less than a third draft to anyone else, even a co-author. I've written books with people and (laughs) I don't show them anything before a third draft because 
you know, you just get something out and then you rework it and you rework it and you rework it. And it's kind of like chipping a statue out of a block of granite. You know, you just get closer and closer and closer to the vision you have in your mind. And, you know, I think that's how I did the language. I just kept working at it to make it clear, but also make it realistic. It's almost like a house. My wife and I moved last year and got a new house and we are doing renovations and you're not going to invite everybody over the first week, maybe or the first month when you still have things in boxes and you haven't painted over the walls or put in any of your stuff and everything's a mess. And, and so it's kind of like what it makes me think here with the comedy. Yeah. Yeah. I bet if I read the first one, I wouldn't be so effusive in my praise just as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'd be laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a page of advice for you because I want to read this story. I'm sure from the beginning, I would have said that even from a first draft, but back to one thing, this idea, of people maybe saying to you, you shouldn't be writing this because you're not a member of the Nez Perce tribe. It's something I talked about with Lori Holtz Anderson when we talk about her Seeds of America trilogy, because it's something she takes very seriously. She's writing about slave children in that case. She tells people, you should be able to write about it and read about it. And I do treat it with the utmost respect, and I hope people will understand that. And what I'd said back to her was, if we go down that road of saying, well, David Osborne should only be writing about the Osbournes, and I should only be writing about Greek people, then the next logical step is, well, why should we pick up a book like The Coming? Because I don't care about the Nez Perce experience or the Western expansion. That's not my experience. I don't care what they went through. And I think the point is, maybe it's even more important for you to write this book yeah. on some level. You know, this is good. If somebody will say, oh, hey, look, look where this guy comes from. This guy comes from Massachusetts, for crying out loud, right? From pretty far away from this tribal land. And yet you were inspired to do this and you do it with such justice. That's that's what I take from this anyway. I know people disagree. I hope maybe that if they do feel that way, they'll they'll think about it a little bit again and, and certainly pick up the coming and check out what's possible when you treat other people with respect and dive into their culture and learn about what we can all feel and relate to. Yeah, well, thank you for saying that. I, I did this out of total respect for the Nez Perce. I dedicated the book to them. All I can do is hope that they will receive it in that way and feel that it adds some value. But, you know, my main audience is white, and whites have, are so fascinated with Lewis and Clark for good reason. It's, a, it's just an incredible story, mm. and I got fascinated with it. But it's a wonderful way to kind of pull people in to then read about Native people. And the magic of fiction is that you don't just have an intellectual experience when you're reading fiction. You disappear into the story and you have an emotional experience. You experience the events emotionally. And so this was a way to draw white readers in with, with a story that they're fascinated by, Lewis and Clark, and then let them experience what happened to Native peoples on this continent. That was really my intention. It's gratifying that you know, as people read it, that's what they tell me, that it's emotional and they, they really feel like they get it. That's very pleasing to hear. That's something I wanted to ask you here as my final question for you to expand on, and that's how historical fiction in particular can encourage people to learn more, but it's also entertaining us as well. I always say when I think about historical fiction, which I just love, I say it's sort of a little bit of a sweetener because you can dramatize it and somebody may not stop and read that 600 page book, but a talented author like yourself or someone who's interested can read that and get out the parts that you say, wow, I love that little bit of history there. And then hopefully make it interesting for the readers in a fictional context. Oh, yeah. With those twin goals in mind, or those twin opportunities there for your book, I wonder what you hope readers will do after they finish that last page of the coming. What do you want them to take with them in their own spirit, their own life, when they go out and live after that? I think what I... You know, when you write a book like this, you, you want people to just experience it. You don't go thinking about the moral of the story as much as you think about the story. But I did all along hope that it would give people pause about assuming that our nation and our culture is always right. You know, we're now the most powerful nation on earth and we tend to assert ourselves all over the globe. And in the early years when I was working on this, we invaded Iraq under false pretenses being completely ignorant of that, those cultures, uh, 
and trigger disasters that are still with us and that will go on for generations. And when I was young, we did the same thing in Vietnam. We assumed that Vietnam was expansion of Chinese communism, which was like 180 degrees from the truth. The Vietnamese and Chinese had hated each other for a thousand years. <laughs> it was in no way expansion of Chinese communism. So we, we keep making these mistakes. We keep asserting ourselves around the world out of ignorance. And we do the same thing we did to the native peoples. And so, you know, I do have a hope that when people finish this book, they'll think, wow, I wonder who was the most civilized in that clash. <laughs> was it the Americans or was it the Nez Perce? And maybe we should be a little more humble about using our power around the globe and insisting that things be done our way. Well, David Osborne, author of The Coming, a seasoned novelist would be proud to count this ambitious and thought-provoking book as among their works. I hope you'll take your talents into the fictional realm again soon. I will certainly read that book. I am glad you stuck through those 15 drafts, so I'll look forward to <laughs> that next book. But until then, I wish you all the best with this book. Oh, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This has been a real pleasure. Again, the book is called The Coming. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there or even navigate through the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, we take it Amazon, and amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just a few extra clicks, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. I really want to sincerely thank David Osborne for joining me and for taking all of us inside this long, slow destruction of the Native American way of life. Remember to follow him on Twitter at Osborne David and let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash history author that's it for this installment of the history author show i hope you'll join us for next monday's all new interview right here on iHeartRadio. and if you're an itunes subscriber please take a minute to leave us a review well until our next trip into the past together thanks so much for time traveling with us today and have a great week we still call it broadway but what's in a name Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.